Are we live? Okay, it looks like we're live on Instagram. If you're there, give us a thumbs up so we know it's working. So we're going to be jumping. We've got our cameras in different places today. And it looks like Facebook, we are live here. So you can give us a thumbs up or go ahead and tell us your name, where you're from. Uh, we'll go ahead and start. I am Megan, and I am the blogger over at Allergy Awesomeness. And it's a food allergy recipe site. Um, both of our boys have food allergies. Our oldest has EOE as well. And he has over 30 foods that we have to avoid. 10 of them are anaphylactic. So I want to kind of create this recipe safe haven for those who also have restricted diets. And this is my husband. Hello, my name is Claudia. I'm Megan's husband. <laughs> That's the short and simple yeah. version. Um, we talk about all things allergy life. We like to do this fun weekly Q&A. And... I figured who better to have on here with me than my husband because we've tried to make all parenting decisions together. Um, he's being humble right now, but he also has a background in psychology and works at like a residential treatment center. So he's been super helpful as far as the emotional aspect of food allergy and helping me. So hoping that he can um, start that with us. I'm sorry, it looks like Instagram. Um, no, it's good. Okay, sorry. The joy of the lives. Okay, so here with us. Both of our kids are home today. So we have bred them. They are watching a movie with kettle corn. For those of you with dairy allergy, that's such a good sweet treat. That's easy. Ah. Um, so I apologize if they're a little noisy in the background. So go ahead and type in your questions that you have for us. Um, hi, Edward Mason. Nice to see you. Um, also, Feel free to like comment among each other. I want this to be a helpful community for each other. Um, answer each other's questions, comment. Oh, I do that too. Or oh, why is that you do that? Because we always keep these available on my YouTube and Facebook page, and it's nice to go back through and gain additional information from each other. So, we go ahead and get started. Let's get started. Okay. So, one of the questions that was asked recently in my private Facebook group now. Let me say, again, I'm all about like creating a community for the food allergic people. And so I wanted to make this page where it would be a safe place to ask questions among fellow people who get it. And the reason why I made it private is because I didn't want spammers. I didn't want people trying to sell things. So that's why it's private for now. So if you go on Facebook and you search um, allergy awesomeness info sharing group, then you'll be able to find it. And just answer a question, tell me that you've got some food allergies, and I will admit you. So anyways, there's been some really good conversations going on in there, um, asking, you know, for different recipes and different things. But one question that I feel like gets asked a lot among the food allergy group is, how do you handle picky eaters, right? Like, ugh, picky eaters are the bane of any parenting existence. They can really, hey, hey, three, okay, sorry, I'm probably saying all your names wrong. But, um, yeah, it's tough. Like, just getting kids to eat is, like, so difficult. And then you add in, like, if you have all these food allergy restrictions or EOE, and then you add in, you know, that you're worried about them gaining weight because they don't have a lot of calories in their diet. Like, the stress level, I feel like, just goes up and up and up. So do you want to start us off, funny and talk about maybe some things that we've done? Things have worked and have worked. I mean, we're going on five years now. I'm dealing with this, so we've kind of tried to do a couple of different things and gone here and there. Um, I don't know. I feel like one thing to keep in mind is that, like, don't get stressed out. Yeah, it's so hard. When your kids choose not to eat, don't take it personal. It just, it just makes it more complicated. It makes it the kids take it like they're not being validated as to why they don't want to eat it or have it. Um, I know with us, we, we try to take the stress out of it. You know, we set boundaries with, like, this is what we're having for dinner or whatever meal, or this is what your options are. Like, options are great. Um, incentives are great. If you eat this, then you get a treat or you get this privilege. That helps. And either they eat it or they don't. So either they get that incentive or they don't. Um, I think a variety of food. I think most people, you're concerned about nutrition, right? So you're concerned that they're getting proper calories, proper protein, proper vitamins. 
So if you can come up with a variety, there's, there's various ways you can get protein. There's various ways you can get vitamins. Wait, can I? Can there's I various that? ways you can get calories. Um, I think that's helpful as well. Um, with that, like, I grew up where it was like you always had to have like chicken or beef or pork, right? And I thought like those were the only protein sources. And a silver lining to restricted diet is you get to learn about different grains and different types of things maybe you wouldn't have experimented with before. And so, like, I didn't realize, like, you know, spinach actually has tons of calcium. It's usually only known as iron. And beans and quinoa and all these other sources of protein are available. So I know I, once I learned to, like, expand my mind and do some research, then I realized, oh, I have a lot more options, like, if my kid is not wanting to have a chicken roast right now. Sorry. Go ahead. Nope, that was, that's what happened now. Okay. So, one of the best, so let's give a little background though, because our oldest did feeding therapy, he's seen a dietitian, I mean, you know, besides allergist and pediatrician and GI specialist. So, he's seen quite a lot, and I feel like we've been able to like garner different tidbits and info from that, and that's been really helpful. And one consistent thing that was um, often recommended to me, so I finally um, did it, is the Ellen Satter. She is fantastic. I would, seriously, every time someone comments about an eating issue, that's what I answer with, because it's literally the best book out there. Like, everyone across the board, whether they were a dietitian or a pediatrician, recommended it, and I think it's kind of for two reasons, and the first is that she got her, I can't remember if this is the right order, but she got a degree in dietetics, and then I had a degree in social emotional psychology. Do you remember? Anyways, she pairs the two, and that's what eating is. Like it's this emotional thing, especially for kids, as well as like you need the fat, calorie, protein. And she marries it, and she basically walks you through. The book is called Child of Mine. I'll link to it um, in the comments below afterwards, or if one of you has it, <clears throat> and comment if you've read it or if you've heard about it, because I'd be interested to see what you guys think. But she takes you from like birth. To like teen years and all the different kind of eating variations that kids go through and the difficulties of each stage. You know, if you're doing breastfeeding, if you're doing bottle, if you're doing toddlers. Mm -hmm. And I just I read it and I was like so impressed and gave me so many good things. And I think the thing she I would recommend reading the whole thing because there's so many good points to it, but it always gets distilled down to this and it's like areas of responsibility, right? And if you can stay in your lane then I think that helps a lot. Because a lot of parents train, like, I think that's what you're talking about, training, like control and take on the responsibility for kids. So our responsibility as a parent is to decide when and what, right? So like, I decide when dinner time is, and then I decide what we're serving. Kids can't go to the store, kids can't prepare things, that's on me, I am the gatekeeper there. Now it's up to the kid to decide if he's going to eat and how much. You can't force that. I mean, I guess you could like put a spoon in their mouth, but they decide to swallow, they decide how hungry they are. And I think if you realize, I did my part, I brought a healthy meal to the table, if they choose to not eat, they'll be hungry for the next meal. And it really is that simple. And we get caught up in making it more complicated all the time, and I do too. Like I think my husband misses dinner a lot with his work schedule. And I know sometimes he'll probably come home and be like, whoa, oh, you're slipping back into that. Like you're just worrying too much about it. And no fail. Like if I can honor that, and then you know our middle child is so he does not eat well. But sure enough, if we hold on to that, he's going to be hungry the next meal. And then they learn to be these intuitive eaters, which is what we want anyways. I don't want my kids to have to clean the plate. I don't want them to have to feel like I only eat what mom feels is appropriate for me. So learning to listen to their hunger cues and get hungry on their own. And I've got a good question here. Okay. Okay, that's a really good question, Kimberly. Um, let's get to that in just a second. Or should we jump? I don't know. I feel like I missed that. Anyways, I yes, I do. Well, I can talk about this topic all day long, but I promise Kimberly Rose, I'll get to that because that's a really good question. Um, and the other thing that I think, like, as parents we fall into the trap of is giving snacks in between you because we, it's, like, annoying to hear the whining, right? Like, I'm so hungry, I'm so hungry. But I know that every time I give in and I give a snack, then they're not as hungry 
at mealtime. And I do give snacks, but not like right before a meal. And it's so hard to make, like, if you want to eat dinner, you can cook right now. But if I don't give them, like, things that are going to fill them up, then they usually tend to come because they're hungry. And just remember that it takes, I think I said, like, 10 times trying something. Is that about right? Okay. To, to decide they like it. So if they, like, hate it the first time, don't be like, oh, I can never give that to them again. Like, it can be a texture thing. It could be a temperature thing. It could be a spice thing. So just give them opportunities. Be positive. And make meal time trying to be more enjoyable than like, I mean, think about it. As a kid, it probably feels like an inquisition. Like, I'm going to sit down and they are going to be all on me the whole meal. You got to eat this. Da, 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 da. Like, that's not fun family time. In fact, do you want to tell them what we've recently started doing at meal time to make it more of an enjoyable family? I think instead of focusing on like, how much you eat, how much is on your plate, what's going on? Um, to foster discussion with our kids. Something that Megan came up with is kind of going over our day. So we should be each of us, Megan and I and our two kids, because our, our baby can't talk yet. But um, we just talked about, we just mentioned one thing that we either enjoy about our day and then one thing that we enjoy about our day. So it helps foster discussion. It helps get our kids used to the idea of having a discussion around meal time about how their day has been going. So, and they also get to see that like mom and dad have things off the day that they don't like, and that we're not just harping on them about what they need to do and that they have to do everything well and have a good day, but that, you know, we have bad days or things that happen in our day that we move past and we move forward and then we also try to be positive, so. Yeah, and we also want to start encouraging them to share their bad things and to feel like they could connect with us <laughs> over hard things, because with food allergies, could come bowling someday, could them feeling different, and feeling left out. And we want it to just be a natural thing where we talk about hard things. Everyone has hard things. And they can see their siblings have hard things, their parents have hard things. And we talk about it together and we can get validated. Oh, that didn't sound hard. Oh, what did you do? And help them just feel like, yeah, you don't always have to bring sunshine and roses. Like, we're here for the hard times and the good times. And I feel like that's been a fun new tradition that we've started. And then I think like the last thing that I will say about picky eaters is I realize that there's a spectrum, right? Like you can give general advice and most fall on the bell curve, but there's going to be those that are like extreme who just like seriously won't eat you're worried about them. And with that, I would say I did appreciate feeding therapy. Looking back, I don't know if I'd say like it was the answer as much as it just helped me calm down as a parent, like, oh, I'm having outside help and to give me some strategies. I don't know that, I mean, our oldest now is like a fantastic eater. Like, we take him to people's houses to eat. He's like, these are the first time I'm asking for a second. Um, and his favorite foods, I'll tell you, his favorite dinner is garlic lime tilapia and quinoa and like, <laughs> like not typical little kid answers. So I don't know if he would have just grown into that because we would keep trying to do those positive things and making meal time a, a positive experience and the no pressure environment. So it's hard to say like, was it chicken or the egg or what caused what? But a couple of tips that we did learn from our pediatrician that I thought were helpful was um, helping them help you make the meal, you know, so you can see what's going into it, they can feel that ownership, um, talking about the benefits of that, like, oh, did you know that carrots are give you beta carotene, it's going to help your eyes see better and make you stronger. Um, we like to compliment our kids a lot when they eat well. I'm like, I bet you're going to be stronger because you're fueling your body and kind of help them understand the why of eating. Um, at one point they suggested when he was really little, like bringing a stuffed, his favorite stuffed animal and like, mmm, eating a stuffed animal so he could be like, oh, I'm bonded with this stuffed animal, they are eating, now it's your turn, and kind of taking turns like that. So they have kind of more age-appropriate, silly little game that you can do um, to earn, earn things and whatnot. So that was helpful, and I think if you're to that point where you feel like, I have kind of once had its approach, I feel like I still like getting results, um, and that if there's never anything wrong with getting some outside help. And then lastly, um, Thanks, Trevor. <laughs> Lastly, um, one thing that we do do as far as incentivize them is I keep this ginormous treat bucket. Like everyone who comes to our house knows about the treat bucket, right? And 
Um, I put all their safe kind of candies in there that they like, you know, Smarties, Skittles, Dum Dums. I try to always refresh it and keep different things in it at different times. And if they, you know, finish their meal or what we feel is like a really good amount and they see their tummies are full, we'll let them pick one thing out of the treat box. And we don't like, I feel like there's a difference between incentivizing your kids and like they have to. You know what I mean? Because there are some times where our middle picky one will say, it's okay, it's not worth a treat to me, I don't like this. And I'll get down. I'll say, okay, maybe tomorrow. And you leave it at that. So like, but you're not going to get a treat, are you sure? And, you know, just you just let them own that. Let them own that. And then let them feel the outcome. Like, are you hungry? Are you tell me hungry? Oh, that's, that's too bad. That's probably because you didn't feel it all the way. Yeah. And things like that. So, yeah, we, I don't think we're perfect. Like, we definitely believe in, like, sugar bribery. But we do feel like we try to have them in it. And we do that with lunch and dinner, not with breakfast, because they do not eat any more sugar early in the morning, for sure. So let us know if there's any additional questions with that. I feel like it's such a big topic. Did we forget anything? I mean, if you're really concerned about your child's nutrition, you can talk to your pediatrician. Mm -hmm. You know, get feedback as to whether or not their weight gain or their weight or their vitamin deficient or anything like that. It's kind of also ease your anxiety as well. Because you might have your own standard of what you perceive needs to be met, and it might not necessarily need to be met. I mean, with our kids, a big concern was them uh, being underweight. Um, which I think partially was genetics, but we definitely would go to our pediatrician and get feedback on, on what to do and how we can add calories to meals and things like that. So that helps alleviate a lot of the stress. Like, you have to eat, you have to eat, you have to eat if you need to gain weight um, or something like that. So definitely get some outside professional assistance in informing you on those things. Um, again, kids are kids, so it's normal for them not to like food. It's normal for them to be in textures or colors. And, and aren't you? Like, every yeah. adult has food they don't like. You know, like, so, everyone has that. So that's, that's normal child development. Like Megan said, if you just keep exposing them and you keep giving them a variety and incentivizing them to try things, um, you know, they'll get used to it, but they'll grow out of it. They'll, they'll get used to the idea, like, okay, sometimes I have to eat things just to eat it not just because it tastes good or because it's my favorite thing, so. For sure. Oh, and that reminds me. So another thing that we did is if we were worried about the caloric intake, we would do a lot of healthy fats. So like avocado, a full-fat coconut milk. Um, I think the thing that was kind of a crutch that helped us get by was smoothies. We got high-quality um, blender. We love blender, like not sponsored. And um, I would just put... So many veggies and full fat coconut milk and probiotics and just make like the craziest concoctions um, just to make sure that they were getting enough vegetables and most kids like a lot of fruit. Um, and honestly, sometimes it wouldn't even smell good and I'd be like, are they going to drink this? But they just got used to like really hearty smoothies. So I would notice I didn't put a lot of fruit in it. I'd only put it to be like halfway with it and then do half pure apple juice and then make sure you just sweeten it out just fine. And so we did that a lot too. Um, adding extra olive oil to things was another tip um, our pediatrician gave. And sorry, going back to the whole spectrum thing, because our child was like dropping weight a lot before we knew he had EOE and we figured that out. We did see a dietitian, and I feel like I've talked to a lot of parents who've been a dietitian, and you kind of had to be aware when you shop around so you get a good experience. But we had one. We looked at it. it was through the early intervention services. Most towns have one of those, so look there first because they're like specialized in early childhood. And she was specialized in like restrictive diets. So she, because I've had dietitians be like, "Then what do you feed your kid?" And I'm like, "You're the dietitian, like, do you know? You know?" Um, but she knew and she understood. So she wasn't like forcing me to like want to try things. She was like, "Tell me what his safe foods are, and we'll work with that." And the peace of mind that gave, that she gave me is that she would weigh him, like, just in his underwear. So it was, like, you knew there's no clothes, no heavy device. And then she would, you know, weigh uh, height and BMI. And then um, and then she would have me make a journal. Every single thing he ate for three days. And I'm talking, like, anything. And it was easier at the time because he was eating three simple foods. But anything that was included in a recipe, so there was, you know, 
cottage cheese or da -da -da, whatever was in it. Yeah. And then, um, and the amount. So he ate maybe one tablespoon or he, he drank half a cup of rice milk. And she would go through and analyze it and come up with, okay, within those three days, he had this many calories. He had this much vitamin A, this much vitamin C, this much iron. And then she would figure out, okay, if he's eating like that typically, then he is lacking in da, 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 da. And then she would help us find multivitamin and iron drops and things so that we could feel safe. Because when he had EOE, he was down to like 10 foods at one point. And so we were seriously concerned about nutrition. I mean, that was a valid time to be like, okay, is he getting enough to grow? You know what I mean? And I think you brought up a good point. Like, our kids are all like, like our baby's third percentile. And I think our oldest is like, maybe it's a 12 percent yeah. now. And so we had this. I had this thing where, like, babies in my family were chubby. And you see, like, the quintessential baby with, like, the big squishy thighs and the big cheeks. And so I honestly was like, there's something wrong with the kids. They're not fitting the stereotype. And I had to learn to adjust my expectations. Like, my husband, bless his heart, can eat ice cream, like, every day at midnight and still have a six pack. You know, like, there's just some good genetics in there. Like, all his family is slender and tall. So I had to realize. I can have toss on our babies and they can be healthy. And I know it's hard because like people, bless their hearts, love to comment like, oh, your baby's so skinny or family members or strangers. And you kind of have to learn to be like, I know they're following our girls curve. I know the pediatrician says they're checked out okay and just get a thick skin about it. Whether your baby's on the opposite end, like, oh, your baby's so chunky, are you feeding them too much? To, oh, your baby's so skinny. And Ellen Satter, again, that book cannot say enough good things about it. She talks a lot about that. Like, Learning that your body's going to do what it's going to do. It's genetically pre-programmed, whether you're going to be big bone, little bone. You know, it's easy for you to be skinny. It's easier for you to gain weight. And there's only that and not trying to, like, force your child to look or be a certain way. And I think that takes a lot of pressure off, too. I know he's always, you're always like, it's okay, they're healthy. Yeah. I, I, I worry a lot. And I knew what my family was like, and I knew how I grew up. And, uh. I know how I am now, so I knew there was probably a genetic component that, especially the young boys, that they would take after me a little bit genetically. So we knew that we were we were feeding them. There wasn't oh, yeah, a lack of eating. not feeding them. So and definitely once we figured out the EOE triggers, you know, even felt more confident that we were feeding them through that. Yeah, that was good. That was good for them. So definitely. So we want to answer the question. Yeah, okay. We'll have to be our last question. We try to keep them around half an hour <laughs> just because, you know, you're busy and we're busy, and so we don't get to your question this week. Um, you can always ask us next week. Try to message me throughout the week. I'll remember to bring it up. Uh, <laughs> what's going on with us? We were getting sick <laughs> the following week. So, the last question, and let me scroll up so I can make sure that I answer all the way. Okay, back to Kimberly Rose. She said, do you feel like you and your husband approach the little ones with allergies differently. Like my husband is a little more positive and optimistic, whereas I'm more stressed and fearful about them. Um, <laughs> I'm definitely not stressed and fearful. No, even um, I don't know. I'm, I'm just kind of like, this is what we have to deal with, so let's, let's work with it, let's work around it. Um, I don't. I don't feel like I necessarily draw attention to their allergies or their lack of being able to have certain foods. I just concentrate on what they can have. Um, other than, of course, educating them that they can't have certain things or they need to be aware or having um, social cues or having boundaries as far as not touching things or asking before they eat. But I don't feel like I'm. I'm stressed about it, and I don't feel like I'm, I've Obviously, try to be overly positive or, or create positivity um, to compensate. But I think we're trying to raise our kids not to feel that they are handicapped, I guess, in a way, and that they need to be treated special because of it. But I think we're trying to raise our kids that everyone has things that they struggle with, and that's part of life, and you just work on. Um, working around that, and, the cards you've been yeah, and do what yeah. you can do, um, and that way you, you don't you know you don't feel a sense of entitlement of, of people treating you a certain way. For people who've been over 
backwards to accommodate me. Yeah, and and also as well that they might they can end up having empathy for others mm -hmm. as well, knowing that other people go through things as well, and that they're doing the best they can. So, yeah, that's my that's my point of view. Well, and I think also um, can really there's a lot of facets to this. Uh, we can definitely dive more into it a little bit more next time because we're running short on time. So let us know like what component of it we didn't answer or if you have follow up. But I think you naturally have to just go in with what are your guys' personalities like, right? Like is he generally go with the flow, optimistic? Well, then that's probably how he's going to handle this issue, right? And I think that I can relate to you because I am the type to like more want to control and stress, and Claudia is more like, okay, oh well. Well, Bill, you know, so I don't think you can expect them to be a different person around this issue if that's how they generally are. Um, and I think uh, there's a lot of factors into that. There's personality. Um, my husband's been through a lot. He had a very difficult childhood, so I think he's learned, like, I can survive hard things, whereas I had a pretty bliss growing up, and so this was, like, my first big, like, ah! like, what's going on in my life? This is not working according to plan. Type of thing, so it was really hard for me to surrender that and to learn to just like feel. And so I'm like always like, and this, and this, and this, and this, and what about this, and what about this situation, and ah, you know. So he often was talking me off a ledge, and I do, I have found that the longer we've dealt with it, I think more centered and um, peaceful about it, I guess I feel. In the sense that I feel like, okay, I understand this now. I think a big thing in helping me not feel fearful was knowledge, like joining groups, joining support groups, reading, learning all that I could. Um, and then they guess we have each other, right? Like, I know sometimes it's frustrating if you don't feel validated. Like, why aren't you stressed with me? Don't you get that this is a big deal to me? Um, but thank goodness we have that, right? That they can help calm us down because we need that that give and take and that, and that pull. And I think it's also harder for husbands to feel as stressed as we are because we often deal with the moment to moment. Whereas like they're finding out at the end of the day and it's often already resolved by then. So I just think as mom, like we have to be the ones usually not always, but if they work out of home and you're the one in charge of the kids most of the time, like you are the one that I've talked to teachers. You are having to be the one bringing things up to the soccer coach and you know, there's just all those different faucets of allergy life that you're managing more on. So I think it's natural to feel burdened with it more often. Um, but that said, I think um, the best thing we can do, at least for me, has been to learn to find peace with it and to not fight against it and to accept it and to surrender it. Because as I've done that, I have felt more calm about it. And I feel like that enables me to um, model that for my kids. Because I don't, because I am around my kids more often than he is, just due to work schedules. I don't want them being like ah, about it all the time, being fearful about it, and not feeling that they can manage it healthily. So that's one of the biggest feedbacks that I have gotten. Um, shout out to my best friend Stacy Asterbo. If anyone needs a good therapist, she is the best, and it's so helpful. If you can go find a therapist to be your best friend, because they have the best advice. Go hang out at like school social workers, <laughs> but um, wise path counseling, look it up. But um, she does phone sessions. She's in New Jersey. If you're not there, but I constantly have to call her. I do. Like it's not natural to me to always feel calm about this, and she has to constantly remind me of, okay, you shouldn't be modeling, and this is a stressful thing, and it's a matter of fact, and what's so great is she has um, some health issues, and so she's had to work around those. And I think her parents did such a good job modeling for her. I'm like, this doesn't make you any less. And you can do this. And we can do this. And we can handle this. And it's okay. And I'm not saying you, you should fake it. I think it's very good for you to be vulnerable with your kids. Like, I'm a little scared about this too. Or this is stressful for me too. And we can handle this in a healthy manner. And, and with that being said, um, having kids who have EOE or have food allergies, it can be dramatic. Yeah, it's scary. You know, so it is scary. That's a real thing. And, and I, there's I, a for sure real risk. And I, I definitely suggest that, like, if you are finding yourself being very anxious and very stressed out, um, you know, to go talk to someone. Because it's important that you are able to 
feel heard, you can feel validated in your experience as a parent, so that when you are with your kids, that you can be more positive and you can feel like you can, you, unload, you can you know? do this. Because if not, you will pass that on to your kids and your kids will start to be anxious and fearful and feel that they can't do that. Mm -hmm. And what we've been trying to do with these Q&As is, is to share our experience, let you know you can do it. Yeah. We're doing it. Other people are doing it. We're doing our best. We can have bad days. And there's bad days. There's ups and downs. But we know like, if we have that ability to go talk out our, our fears and our stresses and our concerns, that, yeah, we would be, be all stressful. anxious and stressed out and freaked out. And we definitely wouldn't be able to think outside ourselves to share our experience with you. And so um, definitely, you know, don't be ashamed to go see someone because mm -hmm. it, it is scary. It is, it is um, sad. It's a, it's a lot of things. Yeah, and my so wife, you know, my wife is, is, is being honest that the atypical husband and wife, that the mothers have a lot more to deal with. I mean, I start with my wife day one from breastfeeding. And the fear of like, how am I going to feed my child? And then as you know, it, it it went into soft foods and hard foods, and you know, it just continued. So I know my perspective was completely different. A lot of my, I had basic fears and concerns about like, what is this disease and how do we go about it? But I didn't have the day to day and hour to hour and the minute to minute that my wife had. And a lot of mine was just trying to figure out how I could support my wife. How could I connect with her? to validate how she was feeling, even though I didn't have those experiences and I didn't have those same concerns due to those specific um, experiences that she was having. And so that really helped to, to go see someone to talk about it with, and it definitely helped as we both got educated about our son's condition and what we could do to help alleviate that to where we could come to our child with a more positive and, and centered way of going about his diet and his nutrition without fear and stress being motivated. So. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I think, um, you know, sometimes it's hard for other people to be vulnerable with you and go there because sometimes then they have to accept of how scary it is. And so it's easy for them to, if they're not ready to deal with that, like, I'm just going to brush it off because if I really sit in it and let myself realize how scary it is, it feels very scary and vulnerable to me and so it's just it's learning to work on it to talk about it together we've had so many conversations about it and we will still will you know there's just so many aspects to it and we're big proponents of therapy we're big proponents of having a good support group i think just as last year we really come to realize the power of having good people in your circle you know the call when you're in those moments of not being in a good head space and being able to have someone be like i hear you i get that and I love, I love all my allergy moms, you know, Michelle, Kimberly, Julie, all those people, you know, I, I went out and I, I saw after allergy moms who had like teenagers who had been there, who had done that, that I could, you know, cry on their shoulder and talk to them about things because I needed that and it's been invaluable. So find your people. If we can be those people for you, wonderful. If we can create a community for you where you can find your people, even better. Like that's my goal. That's why we do these weekly Q&As. Is not that we have all the answers, but we know how helpful it is. That's our sign to be done. <laughs> Just to find that, find people and find that validation that you need and people who get it because it makes the world of difference. So, thank you guys for joining us. We hope that we answered some questions for you about how husbands can handle it differently sometimes with food allergies, as well as some picky eating tips. So, come back here every Friday at noon Mountain Time. We go live on Instagram and Facebook as well. Sometimes we're looking at one camera or the other. So thanks for your question, Kimberly. We appreciate it, and we will talk to you guys next week. See you next week. Okay, take care. Bye.